but you know it was a really especially lovely time i think it was mm. it was yeah yeah very nice that works for me but you know it was really, really a especially lovely, lovely time, time I think. it was, it was. It was. It was. Yeah. yeah we'll get some feedback there nice so that's happy that works for me but are we streaming? We okay. I will try this. Maybe because we have four people. Maybe because we have so much talent. The radio waves, the airwaves are just reverberating. Hey everybody, my name is Troy Myers. I'm a graduate of the Stone Coast MFA in creative writing from the University of Southern Maine. I'm sitting in the sunset. It will soon set. Uh, I'm here with my wonderful co-host, Shannon Bowring, a graduate from fiction, class of 22. Hey, Shannon. Hello. How are you? I'm good. I'm really glad to be here. I'm super happy to have these two readers we have tonight. Yeah, you're, you're glowing. You're so happy. <laughs> I, I know. I'm an angel. Sent You're radiant, yeah. <laughs> Touched by an angel. It's because the season's changing. The blinds will be here any day. But anyhow, I, I'm still very happy to be here. We started this about a year ago. Um, Amanda Plo and I, a little more than a year now, and to respond to the pandemic isolation. And as a way to connect with um, you know, colleagues from across the country. It's a national program. And so... It worked. We went almost, we went every week all the way through May and then through summer and fall. Uh, we took a few breaks. We were pretty consistent. And now we are back, of course, always looking for readers. So if you are a Stone Coast alumnus, graduating student, faculty member, as we have tonight with Deborah Marquardt, please uh, reach out at stonehousereaders at gmail.com. Let us know you'd like to read. Without any further ado, I want to introduce our special guest. So first, Deborah Marquardt is here. Deborah is faculty member at Stone Coast, uh, was a faculty member when I was there. I sat in at least one of her workshops. And Deborah, you are in Iowa, correct? That's right, yeah. Which would make sense because I think you are the Iowa State Poet Laureate. I am, yes. Which Amazing. Is, which is wonderful. Yeah. We had a good old Western tornado last night in Iowa. So uh, was, it, was it near you? Um, fairly close, yeah. It was a wow. Is that common? And not at this time of the year, but you know. Okay. Uh, in California, you know, I'm sheltered for most weather. Do they, do they make you work pretty hard as poet laureate, Deborah? What it, what does that entail? I just uh, I do a lot of I go out to libraries and do events, and then I go to into the schools and do things like that. And I ha actually have a a fellowship from the Academy of American Poets this year called for a project called Sounding Our Place, where I'm doing these special dedicated events where I'm going to um, kind of areas of natural interest, like, you know, like natural park, like parks and things like that. And mm -hmm. then I go out on a hike with a naturalist and then I do a creative writing workshop based on kind of what we learned in the, in the hike. So I've been doing some of those um, special events. So they're really fun. How wonderful. Yeah, I love that. That sounds really great. Wow. We we did a couple of them at Stone Coast. We'll have to bring them back as soon as we get into um, full residential mode again. Yes, for sure. And Josh, thank you for joining. You were you were Deborah's student, correct? When you were uh, No, no. I mean that that is one misapprehension we should probably correct. We were we did not technically work together. I was lucky enough to sit in lots of class sessions with Deborah. We talked together, we sang at the same talent show, and Deb was kind enough to say something lovely about my a cappella rendition of Suzanne Vega's Tom's Diner one time. But but no, I was never lucky enough to be her student. Well, we're gonna pretend that you were. We can do that. That okay. suits me. <laughs> so, Josh, where are you at? Where are you living? I, I live north of Tampa in Florida. Oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. And are you teaching down there? or? Yeah. I, so, I'm, I, I, I adjunct at my undergrad alma mater, and I teach high school English as well. Okay. Is the high school English a full-time gig? And then you... and that it is a Yeah, that is 45 hours a week. You know, it is a full-time wow. gig for sure, 100%. And you have books coming out. I, cool. Yeah, I do. Yeah, which is sort of weird, but yeah. 
That's amazing. Well, we'll talk to you a little bit more. I know you got two at the same time, which is incredible. So we'll hear that story. We're going to let Deborah kick off uh, with her work. So Josh, tuck me away for just a second. We'll bring you back uh, and hear from you and let you read also and talk to you and see what you're up to. And so I don't know if Amanda's here, but I will. There we go. Oh, this is cool. Very cool. So Deborah, you also, you, you teach in Iowa. You work at a college there too. Yeah, we have an interdisciplinary creative writing program. It's an environmental writing program at Iowa State. So it's a three-year, actually three-year um, MFA program. Oh, so you work in that and you, you're, you're, still, work, you're still working at Stone Coast. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Yeah. I, I, I love I love both <laughs> communities. It's really kind of an amazing gift to get to uh, be part of the Stone Stone Coast community. And Shannon, you knew Deb from your class also. Um, so we had uh, was it one sharp, one workshop or two? I think just one. Mm -hmm. But I attended a few of your seminars. I think your readings. So I was like a distant groupie, distant fan. And then it was really lovely to actually get to work with her and Susan Conley at the same time. We had a workshop together. It was really nice. Um, it's amazing. Yeah. We both like writing about place, rural place. So we connected over that. <laughs> yeah. And we, and we cheered on all the people working on uh, the literary review too. That's like important work. So. Yes. Thank you. For Stone Coast Review. I was editor in chief last semester and now I'm graduated, so I'm not anymore. It's Elliot Brillen now. And um, so do anything you can to support the journal. It's a great publication. Send your work. <laughs> Send your work. <laughs> buy, an ex buy an old copy. <laughs> and Deborah, you have several books. We have to mention your books. Um, yeah, I've got some books of poetry and I just have an essay collection that just came out. I'm going to read from that tonight. And um, I'm actually working on a book about music right now. Um, I'm finally writing the book about my failed um, career as a rock and roll musician. But it's about it's about music and it's about the performance as spectacle, public spectacle, and it's about listening. So that's a book I'm working on right now. But I'm going to read I'm going to read a piece tonight about um my trip to Ukraine to visit the villages my grandparents came from because I Ukraine obviously is very much on uppermost on my mind and everyone's mind, I imagine. So, wow, thank you for bringing that. Yeah, thank Before you. Before you kick off, can we get a couple titles of books for folks that want to pick up your work? Um, let's see, my m memoir that was published in like 2007 is The Horizontal World. Um, it's about growing up wild in the middle of nowhere, which is my memoir about growing up a rebellious farmer's daughter. Mm -hmm. And then um, Hunger Bone is my short story collection about rock and roll musicians because I was a road musician for many years and I sort of drew on that. Um, Small Buried Things in my poetry collection. Um, and then uh, my most recent poetry collection. And then uh, let's see. And then this is the book I'm reading from tonight, um, The Night We Landed on the Moon, Essays Between Exile and Belonging, which just came out this, this year. And then next year I have a book, a, a collect, new and collected poetry book coming out that's called um, Gratitude with Dogs Under Stars. So wow. that's what I have coming up next, so. Very cool. Tonight for you. And I did not know you had Ukrainian heritage. I didn't realize that either. Yeah, it's it's actually it's comp it, I explained it in the essay, but my ancestors lived as sort of as an ethnic minority in um, in Ukraine, what was then Russia at the time, but it was you know it's Ukraine now. So um, anyway, well, the so, time is yours, Deborah. All right, I'll go ahead and read. So I, that was the beginning of an explanation about um, my sort of heritage in 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 Russia. So um, I kind of explained it in the middle of the essay, but I'll just briefly say that my ancestors were Western Europeans and uh, right around um, the early 1800s, they were invited to come to Russia and take up land claims, a bit like the Homestead Act. 
and um, and so they left Western Europe, sort of the Rhine River region, and they went to what was Russia then, but is Ukraine right along the Black Sea, which most of us know now as kind of Odessa and the Black Sea in that area. And they were given land and they they created these villages and they lived there for about a hundred years. And then they um, and then they left. Uh, they were given um, there was an edict, and they were given freedom from military service, freedom from taxation. They could keep their own language, their own schools, their own um, church, their own religion. And um, about a 75, 100 years into that, their settlement in that area, those promises were sort of taken away from them, and that created this sort of exodus out of. Ukraine and into the United into the United States right around the time that the Homestead Act was opening up land for Europeans. So um, anyway, it's kind of a complicated history, but I was interested in it. I grew up in an ethnic enclave, so the area where I grew up, about 85% of the people in my hometown were from this ethnic group, and they were called Germans from Russia. So um, when I finally got a job and had money, one of the first things I did was I took sort of a roots trip and went to the villages. And um, and it ended up, I was gonna go, um, I was gonna go all the way through Russia and I got sick in Odessa. And I had to jettison all of my plans and I had to take, cancel just everything and then take this flight out of Odessa and try to fly home. And uh, cause it was 120 degrees in Odessa and as I was going out and out to the village every every day with my translator, I, I was getting sicker and sicker. And anyway, so here I am. It's called Living to Tell the Tale. And it starts right here where I'm basically getting on the plane, where I'm, you know, I'm canceling all of my all of my plans, getting on the plane to try to fly from Odessa to Moscow and then Moscow home. Living to tell the tale. The seats of the Yak-40, the Yaklovel airplane that I caught out of Odessa to escape the Ukrainian heat mm -hmm. that August of 1998, were threadbare and wire-sprung as old movie theater cushions. Spanning three across on either side of the aisle, the seats were sloped and indented as if still bearing the weight of the legions of asses that had previously risked flying Odessa Airlines. The overhead compartments were not the cover and latch design that you see in modern airplanes. Instead, were simple open ledges with a ropey mesh enclosure strung across the front to keep packages from falling during flight. No matter, instead of luggage, many of my fellow passengers, mostly Ukrainians and Russians, carried their belongings in paper shopping bags or cardboard boxes strapped together with duct tape, worked into loops for handles. On the list of regional airlines that the Lonely Planet Guide advised tourists to avoid when traveling to Russia and Ukraine, the name of Odessa Airlines was not even included. Perhaps that's because the airline, with its fleet of three aircraft, fell below even negative consideration. And maybe that's why Odessa Airlines had the only seat to Moscow available when my translator, Pavel, had inquired about a last minute flight for me that morning. None of this occurred to me until after I'd surrendered my Ukrainian travel visa to customs inside the Odessa airport. The female customs official, who was heavily mascaraed and belted mercilessly into her deep blue uniform with canary epaulets, studied my photo against my flushed face for what felt like long minutes before returning my passport to me with her right hand and separating away from with her left hand my stamped travel visa depositing it into a slim and irretrievable drop slot on her countertop. After this, there was nothing to do but file through the glass doors of the Odessa airport with the other travelers, past orange pylons and vertical concrete barriers to be emptied out onto the tarmac and into the harsh brilliance of the 120 degree Fahrenheit afternoon. Around me, heat vapors streamed and wavered in expanding and contracting vertical spires. All you could do was stand and sweat. It didn't pay to fan yourself. Fanned air was as hot as forced air. Mirages of aquamarine floated on the near horizon like pools of water. The bituminous gas from the runway's soft tar rose acrid to my nostrils, singeing my eyes. I turned back to wave goodbye one last time to my translator who watched me now from behind the airport windows 
his long, serious Moldovan face appearing even more grim, more worried than it had grown in the last few days as he'd watched my health deteriorate. I had arrived a week earlier, a healthy American woman on a six week family history roots pilgrimage that had already taken me from Paris to Strasbourg, France to Munich, first visiting the small villages along the Rhine River where my ancestors were originally from. In Odessa, Pavel had assisted me in visiting the villages 30 kilometers northwest of Odessa on the Black Sea that my Alsatian ancestors had immigrated to in 1803 when they fled the violence of the Fred French Revolution and answered an invitation for free land from the Russian Tsar Alexander I. I'm going to skip over here because I'm telling, I'm going to read the part that I just told you about the reason why they immigrated. It was a complicated history and a complicated plan that had been a year in the making. And now I was jettisoning everything, boarding a plane from Moscow and abandoning my trip because of weather. In the six days I'd been in Odessa, the temperatures hovered between 120 degrees Fahrenheit during the day and 100 in the evening. From my sea view room in the eighth floor of the Chernomor Hotel, I watched the harbor waters of the Black Sea steam and mist in the port overlooking the Potemkin steppes. Crows swooped from roof to roof then landed on the wrought iron of the faux balcony outside my window in the middle of the night, calling out to each other in ominous cause. Although the Chernomor boasts a four-star rating with many promised conveniences, air conditioning was not one of them. In fact, it was not possible to find a fully functioning air conditioner in any hotel or restaurant in the city of Odessa. That morning, a week into my stay in Odessa, Pavel had arrived as usual to pick me up at the hotel for another day of field research. I told him I decided to cancel the rest of my trip. I'd already spent the previous day in an Odessa hospital undergoing tests and eventually discharging myself against doctor's orders with a diagnosis of heat stroke. And, and if I thought I might get relief by getting out of Odessa on the train to Moscow in two days, according to my original plan, I was mistaken. The night before, I'd met two women who had come in by train in the same oppressive weather from Yalta on the Crimean Peninsula, and they told me that the first-class tickets hadn't counted for anything. There was no con air conditioning in the trains either, and people on the trains had been gravely ill from the heat. Um, if only your ancestors could so easily have canceled their trip to Siberia, Pavel said, after I told him my travel plans. And then he got on the phone to look for a flight to Moscow for me later that day. After I leave the tarmac and climb the steep air ladder with the wobbly handrail connected to the exterior of the plane, I find the interior comfortably shady and cool at first. I walk down the aisle and find a section of seats all for myself. I stash my book bag of research books under the window seat and stretch out my legs in the steel gray, dirty blue decor of the Yak 40 that is mo more reminiscent of a 1970s Greyhound bus than an airplane. As my fellow passengers board, they stow their bags overhead. Across the aisle from me in the window seat is a very young, very tall and thin, very blonde man in an imp impeccable black suit with fashionable black eyeglasses. I imagine that he's a Russian businessman. As we wait for the passengers to board, the flight attendants to break the heat move through the cabin, offering small glasses of chilled champagne poured into ornate plastic champagne flutes. I take them up on several pours as they come and go. For the record, to try and sit, move, sleep, or function in 120 degree Fahrenheit without the benefit of even momentary air conditioning is not to experience heat so much as claustrophobia, as if suspended inside a bubble of molten amber or like being slowly smothered to death by a very large, very hairy bear. If my plan was to escape the heat, I haven't succeeded. It's broiling on the plane. The fans are not working as the plane waits on the hot runway for the passengers to board with the engines off. I avail myself another of another glass of bubbly champagne to cool off. Maybe because I haven't kept any food down for days, or maybe because I was dehydrated before I boarded, I am quickly drunk and feeling morose. I sag in my saggy seat, and I begin to weep openly. The Russian businessman monitors me 
as do the three men in the row in front of me who swivel their heads to almost glance at me in response to my nose blowing and my muffled sobs. But their interest is trained mostly on the styrofoam cooler they have carried onto the plane that's now wedged sn snugly between their legs on the floor in front of their seats. It's full of ice and many cool beers. One of them turns and offers me a sweaty bottle. No thanks, I sob and shake my head. Never mind, I think to myself, this plane is going down. I'm a poet, not a journalist, but I'm guessing that one of the first rules of journalism is to avoid becoming part of the story that you're trying to report. As soon as I landed in Odessa a week earlier, I could feel myself losing control of the story crossing over that line. On that day of my arrival, after I deboarded, I felt the heat, and especially after I picked up my luggage and entered the Odessa Airlines terminal, I felt panic as a mob of freelance drivers descended upon me, offering rides. I had come from three weeks in Western Europe, where all I had to do was keep my mouth shut, and I was able to pass as a local in France and Germany. Now in Odessa, everything about me, my dress, jewelry, hairstyle, luggage, body language, apparently marked me as an American. I've always been an intrepid, intrepid solitary traveler, an old rock and roll musician who traveled with road bands over all over the country in the 70s and 80s, but now I realized I was in too deep. Fortunately on that day, as this realization washed over me, I was approached by my driver, the transfer that I'd arranged through my travel agency, Mir Corporation, in the months prior to my trip. The driver and his girlfriend, who were along, who was along for the ride, plucked me from the crowd of freelance drivers and threw me in my 60-pound hardback black Samsonite suitcase into their shiny Ford. It was strange to see a brand new American car in Eastern Europe, stranger to see it driven by such a young man and his younger girlfriend with long, shiny hair and polished fingernails. I began to wonder where the money for the car had come from. We drove along the three, the tree-lined boulevards of Odessa on the way to the Cherno Moor, the two of them speaking quietly in Ukrainian or Russian, I wasn't sure which. As soon as I checked in the hotel, in reality, not four star at all, but still $125 a night, I could almost hear the voices of my grandparents. What are you doing there? We worked so hard to get our people out of there, and now you're spending money to return? In the next few days, I would hear this question from many Ukrainian people I met. You have money to travel, and you chose to come here? Each night in my air-conditionless hotel room in a seemingly air-conditionless city, I tried unsuccessfully to sleep. No air could flow through the locked door, which I would have liked to prop open, but kept bolted out of safety concerns. In the middle of my first night, just as I'd fallen asleep, I had gotten an odd phone call. When I picked up after the third ring, the man on the other end said, is Olga there? No, I said, there's no one by that name here. Oh, he said, she was there last night. Then after some hesitation, he added, she is my wife, which struck me as such a blatant lie that it shocked me into realizing that he had been speaking English to me the entire time. Why had he known to speak English to me? There's no Olga here, I shouted and threw the receiver into the cradle. And then I went to my suitcase and got out the heavy bicycle U-clamp that I had packed to secure my suitcase while traveling on the Trans-Siberian Railroad. I clutched the U-clamp in my palm under my pillow all night, but hardly slept a minute. The next morning when Pavel arrived, oh, sorry. oh he said, you must be careful. There is organized crime here. They might call and offer you prostitutes. And then I remembered the husky and ruggedly handsome, well-dressed bodybuilder types in sunglasses whom I'd seen hanging around the lobby of the Cherno Moor when I checked in. I wouldn't worry though, Pavel added. The organized crime owns the hotels and, and, and the trains. They own the whole tourism industry. You're a tourist, so they won't target you. But if you are an American businessman, he explained, he explained. I might have some cause for concern. None of this helped me sleep during my week in Odessa. The object of this trip had been to gather a story about answers that had come before me and to find out what had become of the people from my ethnic group, 
the people my great grandparents had left behind in Russia. As a practice traveler, I was supposed to move through this place lightly or invisibly like a neutral researcher. But there's this problem you have when you, when you travel that you take your body with you, which requires you to lug along clothing and shoes and books, which weigh you down. The body that houses the eyes and ears, the nose, the instruments for data retrieval has to come along and it has needs. It has to eat, to breathe, to use bathrooms. All these things take time and money and draw your attention away from the story you're trying to find. And in an extreme situation, such as 120 degree weather, these considerate considerations multiply exponentially. You can't think of anything else. They become the story. Sitting on the hot Yak 40 plane on the runway in Odessa, destined to crash even before we take off. I think of this moment of grace back in the Alsatian church just weeks before, and I begin to cry harder. The Russian businessman rises from his seat, comes across the aisle to me. Are you unwell, he asks, can I help you? No, no, I dab my nose, I'm just tired and hot. He returns to his seat and I make an effort to cry more quietly in stifled hiccups in tears streaming down my cheeks, nose blowing, muffled sob crying. I reach into my backpack for another tissue and feel the edges of my books. I brought many pounds of research materials with me on the trip, mostly histories of the German Russian people, such as privately published books written by survivors of some part of this long complicated narrative of my people. My backpack is heavy with books with titles like Fateful Danube Journey, which is one man's published journal of the trip across Europe from Alsace to Odessa in 1803. And there's another book called Secret Death Defying Escape Finally Told, which is a novel published by Wally Wolski about his grandfather's escape from communist Russia. Or We Ate the Salt of Russia, which is a narrative of a few women who survived forced labor camps in Siberia. When I reach into my backpack, the book that I pull out is called The Last Bridge, Her Own True Story, told by Elvera Zebert Ryer, and it's written by Marjorie Knittel. It's the story of Elvera Ryer's 2,500 mile overland trek as a young girl between the wartime years of 1940 and 1949 from her village in the Glickstall region near the Black Sea in Russia to Germany and then eventually on to the Queen Elizabeth in Hamburg en route to America. When I opened the book, I noticed the first chapter begins with proverb from the Bible. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy path. I'm not a religious person, not at all. I like to think I'm spiritual. But even when I was a kid and forced to attend church, I never could suspend disbelief during that suffered, died and rose and on the cross and rose again in three days, part of the Nicene Creed. But at that moment, I mean to say that the proverb comforted me, the idea of trusting the path. Immediately upon reading it, I stopped whimpering. I began to breathe easier. So, I'm not on the path that I'd imagined for myself when I planned this research trip, but I am on some kind of path. Although I feel shame and disappointment in myself that I don't have the wherewithal to tough out the heat, to get on those trains to Moscow and eventually get to Siberia and find a way to meet those people and to get the story. On the plane, I promise myself that I will return and try again someday that I will someday tell this story. And at that moment, with that promise made to myself, the pilot walks through the aisles to check on the passengers. He's a tall and capable looking Slav with large hands who leans down to explain to the passengers that he and the co-pilot will soon start up the engines so that cooler air will flow through the vents. He's about six foot five inches with white blonde hair and deep cut cheekbones. And at the very sight of him, instantly I know we are not going to crash. That's the end of that chapter. <laughs> Thank you. That was great, Deb. <laughs> Thank you.
Thanks for um, listening. I really liked that image of people bringing in for shopping bags and cardboard boxes held together with duct tape. Like, oh my God, she is going to crash. <laughs> Yeah, it was quite an airline. Um, it yeah. was actually the best flight I had that whole that whole trip. It was like this, just a perfect flight, you know. But I was, I just thought for sure, you know, we were going to crash because I was just so sick, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Since saw the pilot. The pilot. The pilot. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's right. Um, did you ever go back? No, no, I've no. not gotten back, and. It's the it's um, something I I really want to do, and obviously uh, things haven't been traveling in Russia has not been great. This was in the late '90s that I went uh, when it was kind of, traveling was good, and you can kind of hear from the essay that the real plan was that I was gonna I was eventually gonna go from Odessa to Moscow, get on the Trans Siberian Railroad, and then go out to Siberia to Omsk and Tomsk and Novosibirsk because people from my ethnic group had um they had they they'd be, been declared enemies of the state during world war ii and they had been sent to forced labor camps in siberia so there were some of them were still out there in these villages out in siberia and i was on my way out there to find them and meet them and interview them and um so it hasn't been, really been possible well yeah. safely for from my perspective to go um you know since and i'm a, you know i'm a little scared obviously yeah yeah oh so what, just, what year was that Deb, that you were back there that was in uh, i think it was 98 when i went um and it was a good time to travel you know in in ukraine and in russia everyone i mean people were just wonderful actually you know so um anyway I'm not sure how I'm ever going to tell that story, but I hope that I'll live long enough and hopefully things will get better in that part of the world. We can only hope. I liked the when you said that you feel yourself losing control of the story and it's just so completely not what you had expected. And I feel like we've all had moments like that where, so I, I, I really I felt that. Yeah, I'm teaching a travel writing class right now, and this is a common theme that, you know, you want to travel to sort of get away from the problems in your life. And one thing you discover when you travel is you have to take yourself with and you bring all your problems with you and um, including, like I was saying, the body, you know, and one hopes when traveling that one will spend time thinking about all the important things that you're discovering. But in fact, you know, you spend a lot of time worrying about quality of toilets and you know things like very stupid. important <laughs> <laughs> things the body needs yeah well thank you for sharing that that was fantastic it was, um, it was great writing deborah it was great you know i'm teaching creative writing now a little bit post mfa and you move between exposition backstory and scene writing so well yeah I was not lost in either either strand. Thanks so much. Well, sitting and crying on a on a plane and that sort of like sobbing, crying with a you know with your nose running and you know it was that's a dramatic scene. You can hang a lot on a scene like that, you know. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you're teaching <laughs> us. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Do, okay. One quick question: Do you still do you have family back there now in Ukraine or in Russia? No, not really. Um, I don't, you know, not not family that I would know. But as I said, there are people from my ethnic group who are, um, you know, still in Siberia. They, you know, they were sent there for, to do forced labor, and then they ended up just staying there after their status was changed in the fifties. So um, it's a complicated ethnic history, and um, and and I think it for me it illustrates. Let's say this quickly, and I want to hear, you know, Josh read. Um, I think that um, when we when we think about what's going on right now in Ukraine and Russia, you know, it's just not it's it's very complicated. It's it's not simple at all. And there are so many ethnic minorities living within what was the Russian Empire. And um, so, you know, I just just sort of 
devastated every day to watch what's going on there and thinking about the Ukrainian people, what they're going through. Yeah. Yeah, it's a very difficult time. So thank you for sharing that and bringing the awareness that we can to a very complicated situation. Thank you. Okay. So shall we move on to, to Josh? We, we shall. I forgot one thing. Shannon was just to say hi to the parents. Oh, um, yes. Parents. <laughs> my mom always watches the next morning. This is too late for her. So hi, mom. Thank you for watching. Hi, mom. <laughs> and hi to Shannon's parents. And do your parents tune in, Shannon? I mean, hi to Amanda's parents. Do your parents tune in, Shannon? Um, maybe sometimes if they remember, especially my mom. Okay, very cool. <laughs> We yeah. record these, of course. They can always watch them later. Yeah. All right. Okay. So for those of you just joining in, I'm Shannon Bowering, co-hosting the Stonehouse Reader Series, which Troy and Amanda started up about a year ago, you said, to kind of okay. deal with the isolation of the pandemic and be connected to the writing community. And we have great readers tonight, Deborah Marquardt, Stone Coast faculty, and poetry the, or poetry graduate from 2011, Josh Davis. So let's bring Josh in. <laughs> totally. Ready to see him. Yeah. Hi, Josh. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. So it's my first time meeting you over this strange new reality of Zoom. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Thank you so much for having me, both of you. I'm, I'm really grateful. Yeah. And you said that you have a couple of books coming out. Do you want to talk about, give uh, us a little plug? Uh, sure, sure. And and thank you for asking. Um, the, the poet Alison Blevins and I have written a collaborative poetry chapbook, which is supposed to come out on the 17th of this month. So that's very exciting. Very and then exciting. on the 1st of July, I have a, a single author chapbook coming out as, as well, but both from Seven Kitchens Press. So okay. thank you to Ron Mooring, the... Uh, the head honcho and uh, gorgeous presiding spirit of that of that press. Fantastic. Titles? Yes. titles, Josh, so we can. Oh, sure, sure. So the, the collaborative chapbook with Allison is called Chorus for the Kill. So it promises to be super uplifting. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then my, my single author chapbook coming out on July 1st is called Reversal Spells in Blue and Black. Ooh, wow. great titles. Hey, thank you. Thanks. <laughs> That's really sweet. Um, are you reading something from either of those tonight? Yeah, so I'm going to start with, I'm going to take a little risk and start with the collaborative stuff. And I, I'm calling it a risk because it occurs to me that um, it might be that when I'm with Allison, I write better than I do when I'm on my own. And if there's a sizable gap, we will hear it, right? But, okay. I, but I mean, so be it, you know, because it's the work that feels freshest to me and, and um, most immediate and maybe even the closest to topical or important. I mean, mm -hmm. insofar as poetry gives us that news that we can't get elsewhere, right? Right, yeah. Beautiful. Okay, so without further ado, this is one of right. Allison's and my poems uh, called Chorus for the Kill. This is the title poem from our upcoming chapbook. Chorus for the Kill. My head bristles with the ache of moonlight the names of vanished trees we never learned, flies that bejewel some children's eyes. This place wants to kill us. This place wants to kill honeybees, staghorn coral, alligators, marsh rabbits, swallowtails. When we say the poet's husband shot her outside the police station, I mean I should have been killed at birth. I mean my country hates women. When I mouth another woman's lips, the timbre of one string plucked and swept from a cavernous hall rises between us. This place wants to kill our surrender. When I trace the geometry of another man's pelvis, we christen a thirst for which this place wants no words. This place longs to slice out our tongues. My father loved men. Men told my father he was beautiful. No one else had ever, not even my mother. My father never touched another man or me. Only my brother can say how it felt. My father's red palm on his face, his back, 
This is the touch they both know. Our lovers drink, hold us like sacrament in their mouths. Our children know to listen for strangers' feet following too close, have learned to read every face. We teach our children this place will kill us all for living, for breathing the pearled and poisoned air. All right, so I'm going to read one more from Alison Blevins's and my collaborative chapbook. In the story we'd like to tell our children, the witch leaves an offering of honey and brown bread. She unbolts the door and rides a horse colored like molasses. When she recites the secret word, kept like pocket stones, brambles faint, foppish boys. And the witch enters the stony palace, admires its frozen fountain. At the top of the, the tower, the sleeper's face droops as though she has been living underwater. On the ground, skulls of princes surround her, chalk the witch's steps to silence. The sleeper's kiss, the witch knows, waits soft and easy as a thief, as fire, as the only true tale no one can remember. All right, and now I'm going to make a transition and read some of my own work from my uh, upcoming chapbook, Reversal Spells in Blue and Black. This is called Chapel. And it's, um, it's arranged in sapphic stanzas. And so all you need to know about that is that each stanza is four lines long and we get three longer lines. And then at the end of each stanza, we get a shorter line. And that shorter line is kind of the rhythmic payoff. All right, so chapel. Ask my mother quietly if she'll paint your ceiling. She'll slide free of her chalk blue house shoes ankles naked, wounded, as she climbs each rung, clutching the brushes. Careful not to startle her. Sometimes when we die, we lose our hunger for hearing. Whispers, nicknames turn gray. Each of her orchid brush strokes traces my wrist veins. Swallows, star flares, peacock fans, if these aren't what you want, say so. Beg her to paint us, her and me, as we lived once, lives ago, just two witches of Endor. And then I'll, I'm going to read uh, one more poem, and this is called uh, Foster Mother 2. Dear Linda, you can come back. My mother, my father are dead. I wish I could flip through a phone book, but I've never known your last name. Linda, I could say Island. Linda, I could say Thimble. Linda, I could say Wingspan. Dear Linda, for two weeks you held me, you bathed me, fed me. My child is sleeping and I'm so afraid my losses will linger and breed. Linda, I could say Shimmer. Linda, I could say arrow. Linda, I could say razor. Dear Linda, come back. Two more weeks. I can't weather November alone. Thank you so much. Gosh. Yeah. Another poem. Do you have the father poem with you? Oh, um, the, the, the to my father? Yes. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I don't think yeah. I do. I was going to make a request. No, I mean, I can, if you really want it, if you're not just being, uh, if you're not just being really kind, I'll try to scare it up quickly. I would like to hear it. We have to. I would too. Yeah. All right. Let me see if I, I feel really I have to know you. funny, but I will try to do that. Cool. Uh, in the meantime, yeah. that was some beautiful stuff. Th yeah. Thank you so much. Please forgive me as I'm uh, trying to flick through my email. You know, at I crazy you speed. Too, don't worry about it. You okay. got nominated for push cart for that father. Part. Pardon? That, that uh, yeah, yeah, part. yeah, yeah. I was lucky enough to get a, a push cart nomination for that one. And it makes a great companion to the mother. 
<laughs> it's probably the first time we've made a request, Shannon, on the show. Yeah. It's, it's so nice of you. I really don't know what to say. Except I'm excited. Thanks. I hope you find it. I, I would really love to hear it. Okay. All right. So this okay. is part of a, of a micro chat book that I'm working on called The Ether Letters uh, to my father. Uh, Dower sweetheart, I could cut countless holes in the night's fish nets to uncage my keening. A decade teams, 11 years? Speak, speak, I'll walk out shivering, masked under a greenish antiseptic sky. I'm living through my second plague. The first one cradled us like a mother until she called you indoors for dinner. I'm still waiting. Thank you for the encore. It's like a concert thank we're all going like this. Oh yeah, no, it's it's so nice. I yeah, thank you, Troy. That was really kind of you. Our sweetheart. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant way to address your father. Um, that first poem you read. Um, yeah. I mean, my country hates women. Oh my god. <laughs> like it's like oh, that was just it was so powerful, and your alliteration in all of them, but. Pearled and poisoned air. I just thought, oh, that's so gorgeous. And the repetition of Linda, Linda, Linda. Oh my God. <laughs> thank you for sharing all of that. I loved it. Oh, I uh, thank you. Um, I, can I say something about the My Country Hates Women? Please say something. Yeah, I mean, I just, uh, so again, that's what that's one of those lines that Allison and I uh, wrote together, right, in these, in these collaborative poems. But I just want to say that I, uh, when when we wrote the the chat book, we did it at night while our partners and our kids were asleep, in a shared Google Doc in maybe ten days. Wow! <laughs> and I, I I kind of felt like I was the narrator in Margaret Atwood's The Blind Assassin, right? Because she talks about how she she wrote a novel at night to console herself, you know. Um, and I, except I wasn't by myself, right? That narrator is so lonely, so lonely. But I had this other person with whom I was writing. And it seemed to me that we found this tremendous pleasure in this, if I can quote Katie Lang when she was talking about her um, her collaboration with Laura Veers and Nico Case. You know, we just adopted this kind of egos at the door. Let's just see what we can make happen. Uh, approach and we started luxuriating in this really slippery eye that is sometimes her and sometimes me and sometimes neither of us and this really sumptuous first person plural right this we and who the hell even knows who the we is maybe it's queer people maybe it's disabled people maybe it's people with half a brain left in a world on fire I don't, I don't know you know wow. yeah Wow, that's some energy. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I can't, I mean, I can't say anything better than what you just said. So, yeah. Yeah, you, you, you're you the first person to really host yourself better than we can. <laughs> oh, that, that's, love it. that's <laughs> embarrassing, but thank you. <laughs> oh, it's fantastic. Would you like to bring, uh, we'll bring Deborah back? I would love nothing yeah. more. Yeah, because oh. I want to tell her how much I loved her reading. So I had this lighter um, yeah. <laughs> for your encore poem, but I oh. wasn't on the screen for you. <laughs> oh. That's awesome. <laughs> well, hey, Deb, thank you so much for reading with me. Can I just say that? It's it's a real oh. honor and a thrill for me, and I was nervous as I'll get out to read with you, too. It's it's not easy reading in this in this setting online for some reason, you know, to be in a, a, a room with a live audience is a different experience, but it is, that's true. Yeah, but those poems are just incredible, Josh. I was thinking oh. <laughs> I was thinking about that, that idea of the of the we, you know, and um because I would I don't know if you know there was a book called Braided Creek that Ted Kuzer wrote, um, with um oh my goodness, who did he who did he write it with? But anyway, um, you know, their voices just blended. Their sensibilities, the same thing, you know. It was impossible to tell who whose story was being told at any given time. It was, um, I mean, that, that's been the hope. That's been the hope, is that it just becomes really impossible to tell. Josh, when you were doing that, were you writing at the same time? Sometimes. Like sometimes sometimes really close. 
Other times I would launch a poem or Allison would launch a poem. But here's the thing, right? Is when I say we try to adopt this egos at the door approach, what I mean is that if she did something that was maybe even inimical to what I would do if it were my poem, I fought the instinct to change it, right? Instead of change it like I would, I just said like, it's not my poem. Like it's our thing. Mm -hmm. And and I, I like I, I worry that this will sound pompous or pretentious or portentous, but I really think that this act of collaboration, which I do not feel I was trained for per se, has altered what I will do from this point forward. Wow, that's powerful. I don't think that I think that there's something to consider there. I don't think that a lot of us naturally. I mean, I've never considered it, but I was doing an editing exercise with someone in a workshop I was doing this weekend and it was very collaborative and it was really valuable to see how someone else edits my work and changes the voice a little in a way I wouldn't have thought of and his suggestions actually made the piece so much better so I think there's something to said for it yeah I mean, that's so really, oh sorry that's really something you learn when you play music I think that that idea of kind of giving over your music to other people to add their part and and it's it's really true shannon you know it's sort of like it's made better than you could have made it on your own even though you do have to give you have to you know give room and and give way in order to allow that to happen sometimes that's hard to do so i'm yeah, sorry Tim, go ahead no no i i, I did want to ask you something though deb about about your music and and about poetry if i may is that okay yeah. Do, do, you, do you know the, the song of yours where you like riff on Mae Swenson, right? My body, my house. Body, my house, my horse, my hound. Yes, body, my house, my horse, my hound, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, I do have to, you have fallen. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Are, are you willing to talk at all about the genesis of that? Yeah, well, um, I'm doing a whole bunch of those. Um, I um, I have a Tim, the Tim Siebel's poem, you know, that... that um, the one about swallowing somebody swallowing the moon yeah, a few yeah, nights yeah. ago you slept with your mouth open and the moon slipped inside because you have such a big mouth your eyes glow now like a jack-o-lantern anyway i've set a lot of these poems to music and and really made them songs you know they're they're not yeah. like they're like i do with my band the bone people i do a kind of we call it jazz poetry where we take my poems and we create these kind of acoustic landscapes that go behind them and they're just more sort of vibey sometimes you know um like a bass line or something but not really songs but this project is more like i'm taking poems yeah. and um and really turning them into songs and it's been really fun and one thing i'm finding is a lot of poems actually have song structure you know mm -hmm. like yeah. verse and chorus, kind of a verse and chorus or refrain and you know and it's not that hard to to keep a lot of the text pretty much intact sometimes i have i mean to you do that in the swenson song unless i misremember it the swenson. I I yeah 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 i mean it, it, that just blew me away do you know like that that poem i loved long before i knew you but i loved it more after i heard you sing it you know yeah it's a such a beautiful it's a grim poem but it's such it a is but it doesn't feel like it in your voice not to me yeah well thank you so much is that your poem deb the swenson poem no, it's a May Swenson poem, um, and um, I said it. I kind of turned it into a song. So I think it's called "Question." Is that right? Something. The, I think. Yeah. I that poem. Suddenly, I can't remember anything tonight while we're talking. No, no, no. It's okay. It's okay. Are, are you recording those, Deb? Like, you're going to make a an album of poems? Yeah, I want to do a whole album of them. I don't have enough of them now, but. Um, I'm working on, on. Uh, you have to find the right poems, basically. You know. You can use any of my poems, but yeah. you don't know. Oh, yeah. yeah, ditto. Right. There, if that's the route we're going to go, me too. Deb, <laughs> <laughs> uh, cool. can I ask you a non-writing related question? Yeah. The piece of art behind you is so beautiful i can't stop staring at it can you tell like where did you what is it who's the uh, artist oh my partner uh is a painter tom rice and um 
this is some of his graduate school work and um he doesn't paint like this anymore but he um you know he did a he did a bunch of these and they were all in his mother's basement and i i i grabbed one and i put it on stretchers and it's it keeps me um keeps me awake when yeah I, I love it <laughs> i love all the color it's really really beautiful it's pretty wild yeah yeah it's totally yeah. beautiful absolutely thanks thank you <laughs> thank you all and if, any last comments we're almost to our hour little time slot we do it's been a real so treasure to have both. so great to see you, you know. Th th thank you so much deb for reading with me um, i yeah. feel really lucky Oh, Josh, those are congratulations on those chapbooks and thanks. Looking forward to seeing them. And I, appreciate I, mean, I didn't know you're going to read a piece about Ukraine. That yeah. during such difficult time. Yeah, thank you again for that. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks. Well, everyone, this is the Stonehash Reader Series. We broadcast most Sunday <laughs> nights. Uh, we're a product of the Stone Coast MFA in creative writing. Deborah Marquardt, faculty member, State of Iowa Poet Laureate, multi-book producing person. Cross-genre queen. She does a little of everything. That's what I needed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, student when Deb was at Stone Coast, poet with two chapbooks we have to share. There's my co-host, Shannon Bowering. Um, a recent graduate in fiction. You just finished, Shannon. Yes. Yep. Just a couple months ago. Good for you. Uh, so wonderful to have everyone here. Thank you for uh, being here. We'll be back. We have readers lining up through the rest of the spring months into June. But if you want to read, please, stonehousereaders at gmail.com. Uh, we need people. I've had people say, oh, my gosh, you're letting me come on again? Yes, of course. You can come on as all you want because we want we want alumni on the show to read. So please let us know if you're available and we'll get you plugged in. Uh, Amanda's always, I do not remember who our upcoming readers are. Amanda, I'm so sorry, but we have them. And uh, we, we have, we have, a, we have a Facebook page, Stonehouse Readers uh, Series, which you don't have to have Facebook to view. And every week we pop up an announcement for who's coming up that Sunday night. Um, and so that's what I've got. So thank you so much, everybody. And I will see you all soon. Take care and have a great night. Take Bye, care. everybody. Thank you again. Take care.